So there's there's a very big project I've been involved in now for over three years, and that is uh, methods. And uh, when, whenever I have an opportunity to talk, to talk about methods, then then I do so. Um, because this interest in methods actually started in, in 2020 when the draft public procurement bill, the draft version of public procurement bill, said that the minister must prescribe the methods that will be used. We've never had this statement in our legislation. It's not there. I'll, tell, I, I'll, I'll go through just now what our current legislation does, does state. Um, and, and it says that the types of procurement methods, the requirements and procedures to be followed for each prescribed method. That's what's in the bill. So the minister is going to have to put together, the minister, naturally, they're going to have to put together all the different methods that you can use to procure, that you can use to contract for your goods, services, and works. We don't have that right now. And so I've, I've been working on a project now. We are into our third year in looking at this um, to try and, and put together a complete inventory of methods that are being used globally. Um, I'm sitting at about 200 now. We're almost at the 200 mark of, of procurement methods, public sector procurement methods that are used um, in, internationally. What is a method? One of the problems with the current bill is it doesn't define what that method of procurement is. There is a definition in the United Nations model law, UNCTRL, UNCTRL sometimes it's, it's referred to. And it, it describes a method as being a way of conducting procurement subject to a set of conditions for use and rules and procedures for solicitation and ascertainment of the successful submission. Very interesting. If, if, and I, I think there's a good chance uh, we, we can go through the, and discuss uh, this if you would like to. I think there's a good chance that Treasury will adopt this particular definition. It's the way of conducting procurement subject to a set of conditions for use and rules and procedures for solicitation, so requesting bidders to submit bids and ascertainment of the successful submission. So, and determining who it is that's going to get the deal. So that final set of award criteria, the way you're going to decide who gets the deal, is all part of a method, a way of conducting procurement, the set of conditions for use, and rules and procedures for solicitation. Very interesting definition in, um, uh, from, from the UNCTRL. Now, if you go through, and I've, I've just done for this particular discussion, I've just looked at PFMA legislation. If you look at the PFMA legislation, uh, there's reference in there to quotations or bids in, in Treasury Regulation 16A 6.1. We have an instruction that talks about petty cash, written price quotations, and open competitive bids. So we have that le legislated. We also have the, the, the so-called deviations legislation in 6.4. And we have an instruction that was, was issued. Treasury may issue instructions, and they have. And they've, they've said these, these other means include limited bidding, sole source, single source, multiple source, written price quotations outside the 1 million rand threshold, emergency situations and urgent cases. We've got transversal agreements. There's a practice note on, on that. There are practice notes on that. Uh, we've also got transversal agreements on the CETA side where it's uh, legislated. We've also got um, uh, the piggybacking, so-called piggybacking option, where you can use an existing contract with another department or public entity. We've got the public-private partnerships. And then we've also got in PFMA, we have a practice note that was issued um, on unsolicited bids. So this is what's legislated. This is all that we have in legislation. Rotations, bids, petty cash, that's all we've got. Many of you 
are using many other methods. One of those that you often use is called a panel. A panel is not legislated, not described in legislation. Some of you will say, yes, Sean, it's, it's described in the guide to accounting offices. Um, have a look at what it says on panels in that guide. It actually puts panels slash list um, all in the same term. Very little information on panels, but yet it is something that everyone is using. So the, the, the question that has, has often been asked of me when I go through and share with people the 200 methods that are available globally and being used globally, the question always comes then, but can we use them? Yes, there, there, there's an issue of whether it's appropriate to use them in the South African context, but legally, can we use them? And that's the question that uh, I'm going to try and answer in this discussion. There are massive, this is just a selection uh, we've had on this platform, uh, Ms. Mr. Ron Grace has, has uh, often spoken about uh, one of his favorite ones called competitive dialogue. But there's also competitive negotiations. There's um, innovation partnerships. There's a fascinating one in, in, in the US called a letter contract. We'll talk about that. Off-take agreements, pre-commercial procurement. I mean, there are many different methods that are out there, can we use them? Yeah, can you use them? If there's, if, if you have a particular commodity or circumstance that you think doesn't necessarily justify the use of a quotation or a traditional open competitive tender, can you use another method? So if we then look at what the legislation says about treasury and its ability. It says National Treasury may, very important, may make regulations or issue instructions. And then it goes on to include then concerning the determination of a framework for an appropriate procurement provision system, which is fair, equitable, transparent, competitive, and cost effective. I, I'm still fascinated why we don't also talk about um, 2172. But Treasury may make regulations or issue instructions for the framework for procurement, right? The determination of the framework for appropriate procurement provisioning system. So they, they can do that and they have done that. And so um, if, we, if we look then at the regulations, very interesting. Here's the wording now of the regulation. The regulation 6.1 um, actually doesn't talk about a method. It talks about a quotation or through a bidding process. Very interesting. And that must be within the thresholds as determined by National Treasury. That's what the regulation says. The other regulation goes on and talks about other means around the deviations. Other means. There it is. That's what the regulation says. You drop down to the instruction level, we get more detail. The instruction, I'm not going to go through the details here, but, but it's, it's, it's detailed there. The bidding process now is described more as an invite open competitive bid. Interesting. Invite open competitive bids. It's, it's only talking about the solicitation. Invite open competitive bids um, is the is, is what's described then. And, and then the instruction goes directly to publishing the award within 10 days of who, who, got, who got it. Sorry, it, it goes directly to publishing the notice, the invitation on the e-tender portal, and then jump straight to, to saying, hey, you must now report within 10 days who got the deal. So let's just quickly go through, go through that again. The instruction says for bids, invite open competitive bids. They must be advertised. They must be advertised on the e-tender publication portal. And you must publish the award. That's what the instruction says. There's nothing else between 
publishing on the eTender portal and publishing the award. That's all the instruction says. It doesn't say, it doesn't give you any other rules between those two points. The instruction does go on a little bit later and says, says you've got to avoid splitting or parceling um, the transactions to avoid a particular, it, it, that's all it says. So there's, that's the only other condition that's there really um, on, on the instruction. It then goes on to say, hey, you've got to do this within the triple PFA and its regulations. We're going to have a look at that now. So just, just from a PFMA perspective, the only rules we're given for tenders, let's just stick with tenders, is publish on the e-tender portal. Tell them, to publish who got the deal within 10 days and comply with the triple PFA. That's all we're required to do legally. That's all the legislation says we, we must do. Um, and, and it gives gives some points in there on the thresholds. So you can you can lower the thresholds, but you can't make it higher. You've got to stick with the thresholds. Those are the rules. That's it. Bidding process above one million. Advertise an e-tender publication for use the triple PFA act in this regulations to make the award. You've got to publish the award. And and if you don't, by the way, um, go out on an open, then you've got to report that. So if you deviate. You've got to report that. There's nothing else, and no other rules, and no other variations between these two two limits. Triple PFA is very interesting. The triple PFA says that that um, it defines this this thing called an acceptable tender, and it says that an acceptable tender means any tender which, in all respects, complies with the specification and conditions of tender as set out in the tender document. Right now, Treasury have never told us what a condition of tender is. They've told us what the conditions of contract are, but they've never told us what the conditions of tender are. Conditions of contract, yes. General conditions of contract, we understand that. General conditions of tender, something different. An example of a condition of tender, the bid must be submitted in the tender box by 11, 11 a.m. on Friday. Okay, that's a condition of tender. It's not a... You'll never put that into the to the contract condition. It's um, it's there. Tandy has got a question. Hi, Sean. Tell me, um, and and I'm 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 not a fan of having everything being put off on legislation because we have a definition of irregular expenditure, and we know that any contra contravention on a, a non-compliance with what legislation says results to irregular expenditure. And because of that, I feel that caution must be exercised in terms of what gets to be put on legislation and allow organs of state to have policies that fit their context. Now, with that being said, do we really want Treasury to determine our condition of tender? Because we, we talk about a legislation that we want to stand the test of time or the test of any circumstances or conditions. We have many, many departments that has many, many different dynamics and many, many things that they buy that requires different things. So if now we want Treasury to define the condition of tender, will that be of benefit for us? I, I agree fully with you, Tandi. We, we don't want them to do that. I'm just saying they've never even told us what a condition of tender is. I gave you an example, but um, it's not, it's you know they they haven't they haven't yet told us what it is, and and I think you know th th this is what the legislation says. Let, let, let's just let's just be sure that we it says specifications and conditions of tender. So I, I, I agree fully. We don't we don't want Treasury to make that legislation because then we've got this irregular expenditure issue. But but we've got to at least comply with this particular legislation, which says. An acceptable tender will comply with, with the specification conditions of tender set out in the tender documents. That's all that that's all it is. I agree. We don't want to need more detail from Treasury. However, if you look at um the 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 ISO standards, if you look at, at what CIDB have issued, they describe conditions of tender 
And they, they say the conditions of tender are required to establish, look at this, the procedures from the time that a tender is invited to the time that a tender is awarded. Oy, okay. Conditions of tender. Establish the procedures from the time that a tender is invited to the time that a tender is awarded. Such conditions document the procedures, the manner in which those engaged in the procurement process are to behave, the obligations of the tender and the undertakings of the employer. So that's what we must do. When we put together a specification, we should describe in the specification then our conditions of tender. Agree fully, we don't want Treasury to tell us what these are, but, but we need to put that in any tender that we issue. Tandi, did you want to make another point? What I like about CIDB is that it's an industry specific because one of the challenges that we experience in procurement is that especially in government, we tap in different industries that are governed by different legislations. So I am comfortable with a industry making a determination what could be a condition of tender. Then there won't be a complaint of human settlement coming and say, no, this does not talk to me when I buy houses or Department of Health coming and say, no, this does not talk to me when I buy a, a drug from a specific professor or whatever the case may be. So if we get industries like with, with CIDB because an act of parliament, they get to do that. It's 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 less burden for us, you know. But in moving forward, it's still I'm still comfortable with it being a policy matter. And you are correct to say that uh, it's something that we need to put in. It's just that the other challenge is that our practitioners we we really don't put so much thought into the conditions of tender. We still see tenders today that require people to provide financial statements when they never evaluate financial capability. We still see people asking IDs of directors of companies when they don't even going to use them for that. So it's something that we need to talk more and more about and revisit it from time to time because it changes all the time. Ideally, yeah. it might not... It's conditions of tender are like special conditions of tender. And special conditions of tender are never specific for... It's never a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. So it's practitioners now to start appreciating that when you do condition of tender... Think of what you are buying. Think of the industry that you're tapping into. Think of the requirement that they have. And you might have different conditions of tender for a different industry, which should become okay. Not good become one. one thing for everything. Thank you. Good one. Good one. Good, good, good points. Please, please, please. Um, the other thing that we, we must have a look at, at uh, conditions of tender is what does case law say around conditions of tender? And one of the things uh, this in this particular case law is you can't put a condition of tender into your document, which is immaterial, unreasonable, or unconstitutional. And the example that I use there, silly example, is you can't put a condition of tender into your, your tender to say, hey, your tender must be submitted in a brown envelope. If it's not in a brown envelope, then you will be disqualified. If it's in a white envelope, you will be disqualified. You know, that's, that's an immaterial condition of tender. So case law says, the conditions of tender, conditions of tender, can't be immaterial, unreasonable, or unconstitutional. That's basically all we've got. So on the conditions of tender, we've got a, a statement from CIDB on what it is, and we've got some case law on what it should not be. Because those acceptable tenders then get scored for the 90, 10, and 80, 80 20 points using the prescribed formula that's there. So again, interesting, triple PFA legislation says you define in your policy, as Tandi says, you define the conditions of tender. You put those conditions of tender in the specification and that will define who is acceptable and the acceptable tenders will be awarded in this manner. 9010, 8020, prescribed formula, objective criteria, P218. That's it. There's, there's nothing else between, between those statements of a condition of tender and who gets the deal. Of course, the specific goals must be clearly specified. They must be measurable, quantifiable, monitor compliance. But that's all related to the, the final award step. So if we have a look then, and you use a method which is not in legislation, Firstly, 
the bid must be advertised on the e-tender publication portal. That's the first rule. You comply with that rule, you're okay. Second one, you've described in your tender documents the procedures from the time that the tender is invited to the time that it is awarded, your conditions of tender. And of course, they cannot be immaterial, unconstitutional, unreasonable. Interesting again, triple PFA, uh, the Preference to Regulation 2022, even takes out now the whole discussion on functionality. So it doesn't even prescribe functionality or any conditions of using functionality. And then the award will go to the acceptable tenders in terms of 90-10, 80-20, and objective criteria. If you do a bid, and you use a method which then uses either 90-10 or 80-20 objective criteria, then you, you're clear. And finally, you've got to publish the award and you will comply. And if you don't, if you don't do this in an open manner, then you must report it. Those are the requirements. Those are the method rules. So if you use a method for example, such as two-stage bidding, as long as you've described the procedures you're going to use in the two-stage bidding, as long as you've advertised it in the e-tender bulletin, as long as you award it in terms of 90, 10, 80, 20 objective criteria, and as long as you publish who gets the deal, tick, you can use that method. I can't see any other reason for not using a method which has not been prescribed in legislation right now. I'm going to uh, bring Tande in shortly. I just want to share with you one, one more point. Fascinating. Fascinating to see that there is a, a statement in the guide to accounting officers on two-stage bidding, requests for proposals or competitive negotiation. Competitive negotiation is a method defined in UN Citral in the EU. Even the guide recognizes it. Competitive negotiation. We, we, you might, you might, you know, I, I, I understand exactly what that is, but it's even referenced in our legislation. Why aren't we using it? Pandi wanted to make a point and then I think Elizabeth wanted to make a point as well. Pandi. Sean, do, do we have to put all these procedures on the bid document or will it be sufficient when you put on the bid document to say that um, this is in line with the supply chain management policy of the organization, whereby then everything will be on the SCM policy. Because um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the, the volume of, of the, the document itself and also the, 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 the administrative burden that comes with it and the risk of inconsistencies on instances where maybe you might not mention it and then it might be raised, be it an audit query or whatever the case may be. So whereby now you have your policy that is available for everyone to view, and then on the policy you have those methods, and then in the bit document you can just make reference to the policy because I'm always very concerned about bit document that has a lot of information. Bidders read every sentence and every line. Some of them are just looking for everything to litigate. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the, the the repetition of things that are already in a particular document, you put them there. You might contradict. You might miss something, and it might throw you off completely. Will it be sufficient? Would it be sufficient to just make reference to a SCM policy and then you leave it there? Then special conditions definitely you can put them there because they're specific to the As as long as as long as it's transparent. As long as people can access, they've got access to your policy and your policy describes that. Here's, here's one of the things that, that I often see in 
um, panels, for example. Um, you see, the procedure from the time the tender is invited to, to the time that it is awarded. Now, in panels, very often we don't disclose the the, the method of rotation, for example. Um, that's that's not transparent. We 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 don't always describe in a panel document who are we or the process we're going to use to invite people on the panel to submit a tender if we don't invite all of them every time. I, I don't think that's fair on bidders to to not have that. So, uh, Tandy, I agree with you. I'm, you know, let's let's not make these tender documents big and and, and full of full of stuff, but. But let's be very clear on the process we will follow. Two-stage bidding, for example, the, the, the two-stage bidding is, let's, let's talk about this as an example. You go, you go out, you invite bidders to submit a, a tender that's not priced in two-stage bidding, an unpriced tender. Those that meet the requirements in that first stage are then invited again to submit an updated tender, this time with the pricing. That process, just that process must be described. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to first go out. We're going to invite everybody on the e-tender bulletin. They must submit a tender. Once that tender comes in, we will then evaluate those tenders. We will then give those that submitted and those that are sufficiently responsive to the first tender, we will give them a chance to resubmit their tenders with an updated price. With a price. For the first time, we'll then get a price. Competitive negotiations is, is very similar. You go out, you invite bidders to submit their technical submission, their functional submission. You then negotiate with those that are sufficiently um, responsive. You negotiate with them. You then update your tender requirements. You give it to those that were sufficiently responsive. They then give an updated tender with an updated pricing. That's competitive negotiation. That's the competitive negotiations procedure. As long as you've described that in the tender documents, there's nothing wrong with you doing that. As long as that, that process is transparent, can be audited, then you can do that. Elizabeth, I think it was Elizabeth that had a question. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm covered. Thanks, John. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks. Is this making sense? So there we are, everybody. Um, you know, there's there's a whole range of of um, methods that are out there. Uh, many of you might be familiar with this this um, method called a request for proposals, where you you give more of a performance specification, and bidders come back and and they they say here are our solutions to the problem, and you might have multiple solutions that you get. Uh, you can you can use my position right now. Any method that makes sense for you, as long as you comply with these requirements. It's on eTender. You describe the procedures you're going to follow. You make sure that they're not unreasonable or immaterial or unconstitutional. You stick with the the 80-20 objective criteria award process and you publish afterwards. If you tick all of those boxes, you can use any method you like. Hey, Sandile, welcome. Thanks, Sean. Um, just a, a question, a follow-up on what the question that Tandy asked. Um, I, 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 I would agree with her. I, I am also of the view that the the tender document should not be too heavy with with these uh, details. But in the current regime, 
if triple P F A um, says tender conditions as specified or that are specified in the tender document. If then you leave certain things out, is that not a a restriction in terms of what tender condition then you can use? I, I, I agree fully. Um, if you've not disclosed it somehow, if it's not transparent, then it's not fair. It's not just for the bidders. So as long as you state that, and you know, Tandi is suggesting that you include those kinds of conditions in your policy and make your policy available, then, then yes. But you've got to be careful, and I think that's your point, uh, Sandile, is that you you can't hide certain conditions, um, not disclose those, and then suddenly in the middle of the process you you invent something that that uh, you never disclosed up front. That would be setting yourself up for a potential challenge. Hey, Sikhle, good morning. Hi, good morning, Sean. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. I think in my view, what, 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 is, is what we are trying to say is, which I also agree with, my, with the two uh, former colleagues, with the two uh, speakers before, is that if we say we're not making the, the, the tenant document, you know, uh, too big or just because of putting everything, is there are those important documentation that the declarations, which needs to be signed, filled in and all of that. And whatever credentials that they need to attach, they must be attached. But when it comes to those things which are tender conditions, there are those that you can put in as part of the tenant documentation when you submit. And then you also have these general conditions of contract. Uh, and maybe any other things which are uh, which are which normally do form part of the document, but instead of 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 sending it that out with the service provider with the tender document, put them sort of as an an extra A to the document, uh, whereby you can indicate that an extra A will form part of the of, of the whole documentation when it comes to the awarding, and also have a means or a way of of saying where do they access this attachment or this an extra A. And was whereby they can at their own time read what is involved with an extra A or an extra B, whatever the annexures that you put there, which are forming part of these so many conditions that you put in a documentation. But what you're expecting the service provider to submit back as a tender document or as a tender submission is those uh, declarations and those attachments, those kinds of things where they need to fill in their information and then attach the relevant uh, uh, a, a credentials and, and whatever that would be part of your evaluation criteria. I think for me that is that is that is what I, 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 I'm thinking uh, we're looking at because it, 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 in my institution that's what we are we are trying to practice at the moment instead mm -hmm. of having the very thick uh, 104 page or 150 page tender document. So we'd rather have that small portion and then indicate an extra A as part of that. And then it becomes a submission as part of the tender. I mean, it becomes part of the tender documentation when you're now coming to contracting and having them access to where uh, would they access in order for them to read what involved there. Thanks. Very good. Very good. Very good. One one of the interesting methods. Thank you, Sifu. One of the interesting methods is a method called a contest. And and a contest is is something that's used for. Those kinds of commodities where there's a lot of creativity involved in in the in that particular commodity, that category, um, and and you may not have objective criteria. Interesting. Um, you know the the criteria might actually be very subjective. Um, it could be works of art or a a play or or um, a design of a building. And so um, what, what happens in a contest is there is a, a process where um, they, they may not even give you, um, you know, detailed um, descriptions. They give you a design. They give you a design of, of the, the building that they're going to do, the design of the bridge that they're going to do. And, and there's a... There's a panel that that evaluates those designs and says, "Hey, this is 
uh, this this design here is inspiring. I think this is the design that reflects the nature of who we are as an organization. And through that panel of judges, if you like, they decide who gets the deal. Fascinating, not described anywhere in legislation, but my point is that as long as you've put it on an e-tender portal, you've described the process that you'll follow, you describe the conditions of tender, you decide who gets the deal on the 90, 10, 80, 20 basis, and you publish it, then it's fine. Very interesting. A contest was used here in Gauteng um, for the award of the uh, contract to do the constitutional building, constitutional precinct. Not referenced anywhere in any legislation, but practiced here. Hey, Sir Claire. Uh, another another interesting part, uh, Sean, which which it's I don't know other colleagues how will they feel about this. I'm working in a banking environment. Now there is there is a high degree of risk, and 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 cyber security, or I would say, uh, security in terms of the I would call it cyber security within the banking industry. Yeah. Which then says, or which then puts you in a position whereby you can't disclose all your requirements or your security requirements in an open tender process. And then, because with that situation, you you find yourself, you know, because you are now uh, 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 putting out what are your security or your security, your levels of security within your, your, your banking system and then so on and so on. So then it calls for a different approach uh, to this kind of uh, 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 invitation of, of tenders. So th th that's another, I'm just put, throwing this on the Brilliant. table as well. Brilliant example, Sifle. Thanks. Where where you might have a multi stage, so the 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 bid document which is publicly put out there has some basic qualification criteria in it. Those that qualify are then invited to respond to a more detailed specification, which you just give to them. Exactly the purpose of the two stage bidding. Uh, pre-qualification type process, exactly. And as long as, and, and, and this is what I hope is of value is what's on this slide. As long as the initial one goes out in e-tender, you describe the procedures that will be followed. Uh, you you mentioned that the final award would be 90, 10, 80, 20, whatever it is, and that you're gonna publish the award, then you are, you are clear to use that method. Hey, advocate. Any other thoughts? Thank you, thank, thank you, Sean. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you, and and, and thanks to the to everyone who has contributed. Two things, from Is it not striking that when we refer to to the framework, it's a May, but Which? when we go. If you go to the PFMA, oh, oh, I got yes, you. Yes, it's a, yes, it's yes. It's a May. It's yes. a May, right? Which means, yes. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not peremptory. And and I'm trying to reconcile the May, which says you are not forced to, which I believe that's what they're supposed to be doing in any case. Mm. Now, then we get to the conditions of tender. One. We have all the masks now. All of them are masks now. They are pre pre peremptory, mm. right? Mm. And and I want to 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 link this with what we can do. I'm saying that which I raised it during the um, the, 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 the 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 engagement with Parliament. 
we seem to forget that we have a law that has principles on minimality in terms of the information you ask. And, and the, the reality is that there is an organ of state that is mandated to deal with that. I'm raising this because we always not getting how far have these organs of state engaged the information regulator in terms of whatever they are asking. Because it is illegal to ask for something that you are not going to use. Secondly, <clears throat> with, in line with what the last speaker was, was just referring to, for example, in the national security space, I will tell you now, when I was a strategist in that space, we're not disclosing in the, in the APP all the information because MIS allows us to say this is job secret, right? That's such a planning instrument and it, 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 it would be accepted because then a specific environment is required for you to go to details of classified people and security cleared. Now, how do we deal with that paradigm when it comes to then the procurement of equipment that enables that the implementation of that plan. If mm -hmm. that is top secret, obviously even the other one will be top secret. So how then do we do we deal with these realities then from from from, from I want to say from from a from um I want to separate an act from regulations. Because when you say regulatory, you are putting everything in one pot. From more probable, a framework perspective or a guideline perspective. I don't want to go to the regulation because it's not a one size fits all. There are different ways of dealing with top secret procurement issues, as there are different ways of putting a strategic plan that deals with top secret issues, these are the confidential issues. So have we ever considered those? Mm. Thank you. Excellent, excellent um, comments, good, good questions. What I've gone through now is the requirements for a method at this point. And it's very interesting that from the new public procurement bill's perspective, that they will have to prescribe by way of regulation all of the methods and procedures that will be followed from the time that the new bill comes out. Right now, we don't have that requirement. Right now, we've gone through everything that's that's there. Uh, I, I shared with you the rules that have to be followed with these different methods. Um, that's it at the moment. And one of the things that I've been um, trying to work through is what are those methods that Treasury are going to have to prescribe by way of regulation? Because they've got to account for these different circumstances that you're describing now, what the circumstances that Advocate Insulubis described, what Sitley described around... Um, uh, the cybersecurity issues. It's got to account for those kinds of things. And, and if they put together a regulation um, and and describe the procedures that don't allow us to do that, we're, we're going to have a very difficult public procurement space. And um, and so we we move. Yeah, this is what we've gone through at the moment. This is where we are at the moment. But we're moving into a place where it's going to be very very difficult where these regulations, where these methods are going to have to be described. 
Thank you, everybody. I hope that was useful. Just um, wonderful to see the attendance today. Are there any other comments? Any other points that you'd like to raise? Sean, can I make a request? Thank you, Tandi. Um, you, you, you listed these methods, right? And there, there are quite a lot of them. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah, and and there are there are certain methods that certain organs of state are using, even though they're not legislated. There are certain methods that some organs of state are using, but not outright. Go to that slide, that slide, the one that has methods. Um, can can I request, and I think everybody will guide if that would be acceptable or not, that on these methods that you've identified here, maybe select five or six that are commonly relevant for us and maybe unpack them because Procurement method so far, it has become a policy matter. And I know, for example, your negotiated, uh, you mentioned it, negotiate, comparative negotiating something, something. Yes, this one, comparative negotiation. It happens, however, some people don't even know that it's comparative negotiations, actually, you know. And because it has not been qualified properly, the struggle to even know how to go about it, then the AG yeah. comes, there's findings, there's all of things that actually uh, uh, work out bad for, 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 for the organs of state. So maybe can you just look at these and maybe pick up even five or six that are probably would be relevant for the South African environment and unpack them for, 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 their, for the sake of their policies. Because I know that there's a lot of methods that are being used, but they've not been qualified as such. Mm -hmm. And because they've not been qualified, they're not in the policy, AG comes with their opinions, and then the mm. opinion OEG becomes law, it becomes regular expenditure, it just becomes unnecessary. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So, yeah, so that's yeah. my my request, maybe as a follow up from this uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Happy, happy to do that. And um, yeah, you know, this what I've put on this particular slide here is just as a small sample of the two hundred methods which are out there, and uh, can certainly do that. I was planning next week to run through an update on on the um, public procurement bill and if there is interest uh, and we, we, we're not going to have the update there, there's not going to be a discussion this Friday that we anticipated um, at NCOP so that's not going to happen this this week and uh, so I do have a an open slot next week um I I'm I I got um, a lot of interest in in talking about two-stage bidding uh, so we could certainly do that one this competitive negotiations is one happy to talk through things like contests if you'd like to do that um, are there any that um, jump out for you I, I think competitive negotiations would be an interesting one to see. Uh, any any others that um, people would like us to to cover you can put them in the chat. I think the chat is open. Yeah, I think evergreen contracts or long-term contracts also, <laughs> um, especially. Oh, I, 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 I'll very, put this in here. Yeah, intentionally very to, interesting. Uh, very yeah. interesting on the on the municipal space on the requirements of the Systems or Structures Act. Yeah, I think it's, it it will also be very interesting. Yeah, the catalog and e catalog take a lot. That one also, you know, I I do think also uh, there would be some need sometimes. So yeah, thanks. Good one. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Hermie. Off, off take agreements also. Off take. Uh, interesting. Um, yeah, off take. Very, very interesting uh, method and off take. Very interesting. Um, did someone else raise their hand? So, so it's gone. All right. Very good. Very good. Happy to happy to do that more certainly. Hey, Polani. Uh, thanks, uh, Sean, and uh, good uh, day to everyone. Uh, very, very, very healthy uh, conversations happening here. If we had more time, I think there's more that we could have exhausted on this one. Um, 
because of some limitations, especially the one that we touched on on the panels. Um, and in my closure, I'll also just go to the last slide that you just showed of those methods. There's were some there I wanted to just also request you to put them on. But going towards that one is, yes, especially on the panels, um, yeah. I also concur with what the, the colleagues were saying that uh, there is a limitation that we must accept on what Treasury will put as legislation and then the balance of that, we try to factor it in, in policy, uh, but organizationally wise. However, I think, I think we are still lacking a healthy balance, if I might say, Scott, yeah. on the legislation from the big guys and yeah. organizational policies. Yeah. Uh, because policy, you can say we'll do something and then it's never done which yeah. becomes an issue when HA comes to say, you had said you were going to do this. Why did you not do it? Yeah. And then for for, uh, for a lack of a way to treat that uh, unfortunate event, AG will resort to saying, anyway, legislation doesn't account for what you have done, so everything irregular. Yeah. And then we are having a, big challenge, especially I'm from the municipality space with AG in those regards, whereby yeah. when we try to describe the dynamics that affected this contract, and then it's just a fight we're not winning, yeah. because AG always believe they have the last say. So I think we, we are in need of that healthy balance in those instances, especially in panels, because it's rising month after month, year after year in cases where now the root of the panel is used, but not everyone in that panel will be utilized. Yeah. And we just gave people false hope for nothing. And there's not even a lot of work to go around in that field, but they chose a panel. And yeah. we just left perplexed. Why did you even go that route? So I think it's something that really needs a serious concern because H is having a field on that one and irregular expenditures are blowing up and after this audit, we're gonna see a real bad picture of uh, government. With that being said, on this one that we're showing now, the innovation partnership uh, one to me also is also interesting. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I think uh, it will also lead to the triple P's, the private partnership, uh, public, uh, and that one also, I think, as government, we are still failing to really mm. uh, work on that because it has opportunities. But as I'm saying, we, we, without this healthy balance between policies and the legislation, mm. we are not winning because when you engage a private partner to partner with a certain entity, then policy is saying this, but the legislation is saying that. And then there are many projects that can't even start on the ground because of them. So to me, that one uh, is one I also wanted to say, can we put that one in in that um, discussion? Thank you. Thank you. For that. Thank you. Good, good one. Good one. Yeah. Hi, Hermie. I saw Hermie raised. Hi, Hermie. Let's, let's jump to Mohammed. Hello, Mohammed. Welcome. Thank you, Sean, and good morning to all the participants. Apologies for joining late. I was in a, another work meeting. We, we're uh, uh, honored that you've joined us, Mohammed. <laughs> um, honored to be here. Um, Sean, um, in terms of, I don't know if it was discussed in the, when you were discussing panels, but I think maybe the, one of the challenges I face is, you know, in the, the panels, sometimes the members, I don't know whether they get too comfortable that they are now part of this panel of the entity. Yeah. And the prices that they charge are, are not market related. Mm. Um, and, you know, we've, you some, they, they'll give you a quote, let's say the lowest quote from your panel is X. And you look at it and you say against your budget and what you thought it would cost, it doesn't make sense. So you, if you have the time, you, you test the market and the market tells you it's actually half X. Mm. And a question would be, why didn't those other people 
that we tested the market come onto the panel. You know, there's various reasons about why they didn't yeah. come yeah. or they didn't know about it or they didn't really want to be a, on a panel of a, of a government entity. But parking that aside, I think the, the main crux is and the main challenge I face is, okay, this time I went back to the panel and I said, guys, your, your prices are not, you know, I can get this less outside. Come on. Mm. This is not- mm. This is you, 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 you end up negotiating. But the thing is, you know, I would like the leeway then to say, okay, I'm not going to use this panel. I'm actually for the service, I'm actually going to use this other service provider that would provide all the functionality, meet all the criteria, because actually the panel for this particular procurement is not helping me. And I can save the entity, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, because all of us are under a lot of pressure in terms of our budget. So I think that's my contribution to, to panels. Thank you. Mohamed, thank you. Um, it, very, very interesting, uh, this, this panel discussion. We, we are, based on the work I've done, one of two countries in the world that actually use what we term a panel. Um, refer to it as a panel. Uh, and that's ourselves, and there is um, some of the states in Australia that uh, that use it. But the rest of the world doesn't, right? Um, and and one one thing that um, they do is they use what they term framework agreements. Um, and a panel is a form of a framework agreement. But once once you start making that connection, you start seeing that there's a whole range of different types of framework agreements or panels. And um, the one thing you've raised, Mohammed, is a panel which is a non-exclusive panel that gives you the ability to go outside the panel at any point you'd like to. Um, the other, other type of framework is, is an open framework that allows you to add other bidders onto the panel later, after the initial panel has been formed. Um, and these, these are all the, the rich options that we've got. If we, if we stop thinking about panel, which is not described anywhere, um, and, and we're only really... Um, you're know, informed by what we think it is, because no one's told us what it really is or what the options are. And we start looking at other potential methods such as frameworks and then draw on the richness that exists in other methods. I think um, we could certainly get there. So I, I think panels, we've got to have a big discussion on and, and happy to do that. And happy to share with you as well some of those, those options you can build into a panel, such as open panel non-exclusive panels and there are others there's there's a there's a there's a panel called a one stage um where you don't have a second quotation uh, process it's just um you just go directly to the panel use this one then use this one then use this one there's no second quotations process which is which we all think is is a great way to avoid having to go out on a tender but uh, it, that's that's what's hurting us very often. That second quotations process is what's hurting us in the in the, in the findings. But Polani, I think you raised your hand, Polani. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, you just nailed it on the head. And the typical example you just gave, uh, you are showing that you are sharing it on the perspective of us government trying. Yeah to have a way forward with the contract or tender we have. But that is exactly the point of contention where we fight with AG to say, when you issued out your tender, you said the conditions of, of tender, you said your specifications, you said that for three years, you want a panel. You never said in the middle of the process, you're gonna add more people now in this panel. You never said if this panel doesn't work, you will go out and so, that is exactly oh, the point I'm saying. We really need a, a, a session and we really need a healthy balance between legislation and policy on these ones because in the absence of something to stand by, yeah. H in our resort to say everything irregular. 
Yeah. Even yeah. if the whole yeah. panel of 20 people was administrated well, one incident where there was an unfortunate situation, everything, they say go back to when it started and then it's just a big mess. So, yeah, it doesn't do too short. That, too good short one, that good one. Thanks for money. Happy to do that and we'll certainly put panels on the discussion for uh, for a future session. Um, I've, I've tried to... Uh, there's there's um, advocates, Helen Fenter has got some great points as well around panels. I'm just trying to bring her into that. She's also written up quite a bit on um, on legal panels, good ways of having legal panels. So uh, certainly, thank you, everybody. Great, great points uh, mentioned by all. Uh, that was the focus of today's discussion. Happy um, to take any further questions if you've got, but uh, you've given me some good good points to go through. Um, just to answer, um, thanks, I see your hand there, Elizabeth. Just to answer Mohammed's question, Mohammed, um, the, the, the key point is we've just got to be transparent up front in the first tender as to how we're going to manage things, and, and then we can do it. But that's our, that's our problem is we don't do that. Then it's um, we get to these difficult circumstances where you get prices that are not market related, and and then we we're stuck because we didn't tell them that we're going to have an open panel. We're going to this is non exclusive, and we we have the right to go outside. Um, difficult situation we get into. Hey, Elizabeth. Um, thanks, Phil. I I see in your presentation you you've made reference to the instruction note two as 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 the source as one of your source documents. But that there was instruction note uh, nine, which was issued in 2022, 2023, which is actually adding more information on the publishing of a bit information on 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 the e tender portal it's no longer only talking about advertising and then a uh, publication of the award on 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 the portal but it also talks about a uh, capturing of bidders information like the list of bids received the names of bidders uh, who responded to your to your to your bids as well the cancellations and any um, a, a amendment to 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 your bid document? Are we are we going to be looking at adding some of that information as well in the near future? Information that's, from that's that particular. Thank you. Very very familiar with uh, instruction nine, and um, yes, that is something that we need to unpack some more. So good good point. I think we can do that. Great great point. Thank you. Excellent, everybody. Thank you very much. I, I think that's um, that's it for the day. Then we will see you next week. If there is any material development on the public procurement bill, we'll certainly cover that next week. If not, let's uh, let's unpack a method. And I think I'm starting to hear which one is the one that we might uh, look at more closely next week. So uh, we'll try and get the email out quicker and sooner than we did this morning. My apologies for the late. Um, message today but um yes we'll be back again at 10 o'clock next week if all goes well thanks everybody thank you all for your contributions today wonderful okay thank you sean thank you Alex. thanks Hitler. hey Eunice.